Welcome everybody. We are just getting started and going live right now for everybody that's joining us as an attendee. You can type questions in the chat or in the Q&A and we will get to them. So we are just one minute before the hour, Do we, um, but we want to be welcoming people who are already coming on. Um, my name is Medea Benjamin with Code Pink, and you also just heard from Ariel Gold. Uh, and we are very delighted that we have a special guest with us on a very unfortunate anniversary marking the uh, end of five years of war in Yemen. Uh, it's, um, uh, we want to mark that anniversary uh, because when the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, started getting involved in the war in Yemen, uh, he said that this would be over in just a couple of weeks. Um, and here we are uh, five years later. So our guest today with us is Aisha Jamal. And uh, she is a Yemeni American. She's the president of the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. Uh, she has over 30 years of experience in public health. Um, something that is important today more than ever. She is uh, uh, has a PhD in epidemiology. And um, unlike uh, many people in the healthcare field, uh, Aisha is also very involved in the politics. And I know you from, for quite a while now, uh, having worked closely on issues related to US policy in Yemen, uh, lobbying Congress, trying to get Congress to stop the Trump administration from supporting the Saudis and their bombing of Yemen, something that we should say actually started under the Obama administration. So thank you so much, Aisha, for joining us. And um, if you could start out telling us a little bit more about yourself and your organization. Thank you, Medea, for inviting me. And thank you for everyone who are joining this call today. Um, as you said, I'm, I was born and raised in Yemen, and I came to the U.S. To, for my um, university and college, college and graduate work. I've been very interested in public health from the very beginning, and um, so I have my Ph.D. in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina and my master's in public health from uh, Emory University. Uh, I started Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation because of the war on Yemen. Uh, people calling it a civil war, and I strongly disagree with that because when you have Saudi Arabia and 17 other countries that are actively fighting uh, in Yemen, in addition to countries like the US and the UK and France and everybody else who is providing them um, the weapons for the war, it's not a civil war. It's actually an aggression on the population of Yemen by the led by the Saudis. So what they call a Saudi-led coalition, it is a Saudi-led attack and aggression on the people of Yemen. Uh, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, as I said, was established to um, re provide relief in Yemen. In addition to the daily bombing since day one, which was March 26, um, 2015, the Saudis also imposed a block blockade on Yemen. So nothing can get in or out of Yemen without Saudi approval. For me to go to Yemen, I have to submit my name to the Saudis for, to get approval to get into my home country. This is how ridiculous this whole thing is. So we've been providing relief work to um, inaccessible areas. A lot of the relief agencies in Yemen cannot reach uh, either places that are far away because of the geography of, in Yemen. Yemen has the highest mountains in the Middle East. A lot of people don't realize that. And Yemeni live at the very top of these mountains. And so they are small settlements. Uh, aid, international aid organizations cannot get to these settlements because it's too expensive and they need to have security to get to these places. We work in these places. We also work in places that are bordering Saudi Arabia where there is daily bombing for 
five years and tomorrow will be uh, the sixth year. Uh, we have access to all over Yemen because we work with volunteers from the communities where we deliver aid. Uh, please visit our website because we actually do quite a bit uh, of work in Yemen, including supporting orphans. We have over 450 orphans that we support with uh, monthly allowance. And we also have a lot, a lot of other projects uh, of interest is we also got funding from the Canadians to do a water purification project for Yemen. And we're very excited about that. And also Welcome Trust in England uh, are supporting us to do some cholera work as well. So we're very uh, happy with all the work that we're doing in Yemen. I also want to say here that we're all volunteers. So th the work that we do for Yemen Relief uh, in the US, every single person is a volunteer. And in Yemen, everybody who's working with us is a volunteer. We do have two people whom we pay, and those are people who do our finances. And they are consultants, and we pay them by the hour. Wow, a very lean organization um, that does fantastic work. So thank you for that. Um, if we could go back to the origins of this crisis, it's interesting that you don't call it a civil war. Do you think it started out as a civil war? And for those who haven't been following this, why did the Houthis rise up in the beginning? So there, there've been multiple civil wars in Yemen and the Houthis have had problems with the central government for a long time and started in 2014. And uh, guess why? <laughs> the main reason they had a conflict with the central government in 2004, that is because they objected to the invasion of Iraq by US forces. So this goes back to um, them saying Yemen should not have been part supporting the, in, the US invasion that was based on a lie as we all know now. Hmm. Uh, I, with, there were no fighting. When people say civil war, even when the Houthi took Sana'a over in 2014, there was really no fighting. They, took, they just entered Sana'a and there was no fighting. So even that, to call that civil war, that's actually uh, in, in, not people try to muddy the water when they call it that civil war. They did go, uh, I think after they took over Sana'a, uh, there were negotiations, there was a UN envoy, his name was uh, Jamal bin Omar, and he was negotiating with all the Yemeni parties uh, to the conflict to uh, you know, establish a unity government. On uh, March 24 uh, or 23 of 2015, he announced, and there is an article by um, the Wall Street Journal on this, he announced that the Yemeni have reached an agreement and there is gonna be a unity government established. On that night where that he made the announcement, the Saudi government invited him to go to Riyadh. Within two days, they started bombing Yemen. So there was no interest for the Saudis, and it, uh, for them, that the Yemeni reached an agreement. And the fact that they uh, bombed two days after the agreement also indicates that they were planning this ahead even of the, uh, the Yemenis reaching an agreement. This didn't happen overnight. One thing I want to say to my American fellow citizen is that war on Yemen was announced from Washington, D.C. It was not announced from Riyadh. So this uh, also was the time that King Salman in Saudi Arabia uh, gave the power to his son, Mohammed bin Salman, to run the uh, military. And so this was his, uh, his venture uh, into Yemen. And do you think that he ever thought that this would still be going on five years later? Oh, I don't think anybody, uh, including me, that it was going to go this long. I remember watching the news and they're, they're the Saudis and the Emirates together because they were the lead on this, saying two weeks to a maximum of two months and this will be over. Everybody thought that. I also want to um, point to the fact that the German intelligence actually in 2015 published a report calling Mohammed bin Salman a destabilizing person for the Middle East. German intelligence are not normally a group that we hear a lot about. 
And when they, they only reason they published that report is because they really felt there is a danger that the Middle East is going to spiral into more violence with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman. And then um, on the part of the Houthis, it has been portrayed oftentimes in the US press uh, that they are uh, really being um, organized, mobilized, furnished uh, by Iran. What is What was the relationship between the Houthis and Iran in the beginning of this? And what is the relationship today? Well, I, I would say that um, I would go to President uh, Obama's actually. Uh, he made two interviews with the New York Times in which he very specifically said that there was no relationship or strong relationship between the Houthis and uh, Iran. So if the president of the US who authorized the US participation in the slaughter of the Yemeni people, he himself said there was no relationship between Iran and the Houthis, I'll take that because I actually believe that. Um, there was a, you know, an, an effort to portray this, the narrative uh, that, that, is, that the Saudis are fighting Iran in Yemen. It's a narrative that is very important in the PR uh, environment because unfortunately, a lot of people in the US view Iran as an enemy. And if we are fighting Iran in Yemen, then a lot of people will think it's okay. I actually think it's a PR narrative to let the American people not be outraged by what's going on in Yemen. And over time, actually, the relationship, I would say, strengthened rather than we, uh, if it wasn't non-existent, it strengthened. And if we go back to uh, the brother of the current uh, you know, leader of the Houthis, he actually did not like the Iranians. And, and one of the wars that they had with Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was the president of Yemen, uh, the Iranians sent money to his party without his knowledge and uh, people in his party took it. He actually asked them to send the money back to Iran because he did not want any money from Iran. So if you I just want to say this yeah. also is mentioned by an article by Robert Worth in the New York Times for people who are interested in references for what I'm saying. Yes, I remember that article, a very, very good one. Uh, but as you said, as time goes by, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy because then Iran does become involved uh, because the Houthis are looking for allies, they're looking for weapons. Uh, and so would you say that um, if, the, if Iran is not that big an influence among the Houthis, then why are the Saudis so determined to continue this struggle? The Saudis have always, I think there, were, there are two parts to this. Mohammed bin Salman, when he became the Minister of Defense, he thought this was gonna be an easy win and this was gonna propel him to be the next king. Because at that point in time, 2015, he was second in line to his cousin, Mohammed bin Nayef. So he thought if he became a, a national hero, then he would become the, the, you know, the king immediately after his father. Of course, that, that didn't pan through. And now it's very challenging for him to get out of war that he started where he thought he's gonna win in two months and it's five years. And militarily, everybody knows including the US government, that this is not a, 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 something that anybody is gonna win militarily. So uh, according to a lot of the people who uh, are you know, trained in, in, in policy and uh, politics, keep saying we need to find a face uh, saving way for Mohammed bin Salman to get out of this. And I think the only group that he would listen to is the US administration. So the US administration needs to come up with a way for him to get out of this because he definitely now knows he cannot win it. So as uh, wars rage on, um, there are end up uh, almost always being sort of no good sides. Uh, there have been reports about uh, human rights violations and atrocities committed by the Houthis. And of course, uh, we uh, know that the Saudi bombing has been so destructive of the infrastructure, hospitals, clinics, all of those things. Can you, um, I, I don't know that you want to weigh more than the uh, one over the other, but you, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the different parties and the level of destruction? 
Um, yes, actually, it, it, it's a war. And like you said, in wars, there is no, uh, no good side. But uh, I would also refer people to the Yemen Data Project that shows that 70% of the civilian deaths and uh, over 70% of the destruction in Yemen is done by the Saudi-led coalition. So they're not equal. And uh, in terms of the corruption, or at least in terms of what's available in Yemen because of the blockade, my point, and I've tried to communicate this to multiple people, is Yemen is under a blockade. Only 20% of what Yemen needs gets into Yemen. Then these commodities become very precious. And because they become very precious, then you are now giving power to those inside to monopolize it. If there is no blockade, if everything is, in, is available in Yemen, we would not need to worry about the Houthis monopolizing or insisting that they get some of what gets into the country. Uh, so I think we need to look at root causes rather than as symptoms. Uh, it's very similar to the coronavirus. We can't just look at the symptoms and try to deal with it. We need to look at the root cause and the root cause is infection and people are being asked to stay home uh, so there is no infection. And in Yemen, people are forgetting that and they're also looking at the symptoms and they're and not looking at the root cause, which is what is get, getting into Yemen. I tried to send um, reagents for the coronavirus that were donated by the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. I could not get them into Yemen because the Saudis would not allow them to get into Yemen. And I was trying to use, you know, uh, resources that are available and, um, you know, verify to get them into Yemen. So uh, we need to look at root causes and the root cause of everything that's going on in Yemen is the US supported Saudi war and blockade on Yemen. There was ever a time to end that blockade and war. Now during this pandemic would be that time. I, I agree. I actually am scared to death. I actually was shaking the other day. I, I was crying because knowing what this uh, outbreak can do in Yemen uh, is frightening to me. It's, it's frightening because I know they've been dealing with four outbreaks to date. We have a cholera outbreak that's been raging in Yemen since 2016. We have over 2 million cases, uh, suspected cases by the end of 2019. And this is something that can be controlled. We know what the control measures are. This is not as infectious as, uh, as COVID-19. We also have a diphtheria outbreak in Yemen going on right now. And Yemen has not had a diphtheria outbreak since 1980. Believe that. And then we also have an H1N1 outbreak in Yemen that was extremely severe uh, this year. I also had to um, get donation of reagents for them, again, from the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. Uh, luckily, we were able to get it in. And then they also have uh, a dengue uh, with chikungunya outbreak that has ravaged uh, the population. What people don't realize, these are all diseases. These are diseases where we know how to control and Yemen has not been able to control them for three years now. So, and the impact of also other infectious diseases because medicine is not allowed into Yemen. They, you know, when we talk about COVID, we say elderly and those who are immunocompromised. I would say today as an epidemiologist, as a professional in public health, about 80% of the Yemeni population have an immune system that's compromised. We have at least 14 million people who are severely malnourished and at risk of famine. These people immune system is, and that represents 50% of the Yemeni population. These people, their immune system is, is compromised. Those who have dengue, those who have chikungunya, those who have H H1N1, those who have diphtheria, all these people have uh, immunosuppression. So if we say 80% of the Yemeni population are immunocompromised today because of the blockade and the war, these are the people that we are more likely to die if coronavirus is in Yemen. Add to that, that we have a health system that is destroyed. So according to the last estimate from WHO, 50% of the Yemeni population do not have access to healthcare. 50%. And then the other 50% that do have access to healthcare, they have an access to a very compromised, destroyed healthcare. We have a lot of the physicians who have not been receiving salaries since 2016. 
when the National Bank was moved out of Sana'a, a lot of physicians have left Yemen and we have equipment. These medical uh, facilities have not been updated since 2015. If they have a problem with them, a breakdown, they don't have the ability to fix it because they need to import the parts and they have not been able to import the parts or import new equipments for that matter. So we're talking about a system that, you know, if, if I take New York as an example and we say, okay, we're gonna, you know, 50% of the population in New York, the poor, which is usually the case, are gonna be, not, we don't have any services for that. We're gonna accept that. Okay, the other 50% of the population that we have something working for them, let's assume now we, they don't have face masks. I'm getting requests for face masks. The face masks that were in the pharmacies, I called the uh, pharmacist in, um, the other day in Hadramaut. He told me that Saudis bought the face masks that were in Yemen to use them in Saudi Arabia because they pay more. So they depleted Yemen even of what was available. Uh, so if we go to the New York example, so they don't have, you know, I'm, I've been hearing Como, uh, you know, bleeding. They have ventilators, Yemen doesn't have ventilators. They don't have masks, Yemen doesn't have masks. Yemen doesn't have the, uh, even the reagents to test. The reagents we were able to send to Yemen, it's for 500 people. The Saudis also now are opening the more people to go into Yemen. Uh, Yemenis who are outside Yemen, they overwhelm the system that's in place that was to uh, look into it, people who are coming and test them. If you, and they were expecting 200 a day because that was what was allowed for the last five years, and now they're allowing thousands to come in a day. People are being put in schools now because that's a place where they can put them until they test them, but they cannot test them. And so that, if any, if I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just really, I'm scared. I'm scared because I think we're going to have, a term genocide comes to mind. This is when it will come to mind because we're going to have millions of people, if they're infected, there is no one, no one in Yemen today who can help them because the, the system cannot, cannot do anything about it. I just had a call this morning in one of the where they're holding people who are coming from travel to at least you know, provide them with cleaning uh, agents that, so they clean their premise. It's actually a university because they stop universities and schools. So they are putting people at the university. And now this university has become overcrowded. They're moving some of them to a school. So I'm trying to say, just at least let us provide you with equip, you know, with chemicals, with Clorox, with whatever it is, so we can clean the environment where you are at. A lot of these people, you know, if they were working in Saudi Arabia and they've been deported because they don't have a job, don't have money. So we're going to try and at least provide them daily meals. The, the Yemeni government today, the, the one who's providing services, which is the one in Sana'a, because the one in Riyadh, they're just staying in hotels right now in Riyadh. They're not doing services. They cannot cope with what's going on right now. If the U.S., if the U.S., the richest country in the world today, we have Como pleading for help. Think about if Como has 10% of what he needs or 5% of what he needs. You're talking about the governor of New York. Yes, yes, the governor, because, you know, if, if, if the rich, I mean, uh, New York is one of the very well-to-do states. Their economy is very well. Uh, Think if he's calling for help, if he's saying, I don't have enough ventilators, I don't have enough, you know, even the US, people are saying they don't have enough masks for the health staff. I mean, take that and reduce it by 90%, and then you have an 80% immunocompromised population. What are we preparing Yemen for? Well, and then you have Saudi Arabia on the border that does already have. Uh, 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 hundreds of people infected. Is that the case? Oh, yes. Actually, the, I think they, uh, at least from the news, uh, Egypt said 15 of the new cases came from Saudi Arabia. 
Pakistan said new, ca new cases came from Saudi Arabia. Uh, India said cases came from Saudi Arabia. So we have a lot of countries where the positive cases from Saudi Arabia. And we have now, according to yesterday's news, about 1,050 people, Yemeni, who were in Saudi Arabia for Umrah, which is the lesser Hajj, who they want to bring to Yemen. How are we going to test these people? And um, right now, news is that Saudi Arabia has close to 750 cases. That was as of yesterday. And the World Health Organization says that the outbreak reaching Yemen is imminent. Yes, and they use the world that it's, the number will be explosive in Yemen. Uh, and the reason they say that, because we are not able to test. I mean, they're testing people with symptoms, but as we know, there are people who are going to come from the outside. They're healthier than those who are in Yemen. Um, and, the, you know, if they're silent uh, spreaders, meaning they don't have symptoms, we're not testing them. So we're going to have an explosive number of cases, similar to what was happening in Italy. So Aisha, you already had a very, uh, as you were saying, a very impoverished uh, population uh, that uh, has been dependent on foreign aid. Is that foreign aid still able to come in with the, have they closed off the flights because of the fear of coronavirus or how is that affecting the ability to get the aid in? So, and, and, and that's something that I, um, thank you for asking, because people think aid is enough. There is no aid in the world that can support it, 29 million people. They need to open commercial imports to Yemen. Uh, yes, aid is able to come. What they closed was closed the airport in Sana'a, and even now in Aden, two people who are um, international aid workers. So the international aid workers could travel to Sana'a Airport, while I as a Yemeni cannot travel to Sana'a Airport because that's the laws of the Saudis. Uh, the last airplane that came, they tested the uh, people on the plane and there was one positive case. So like any country uh, with very responsive uh, program, they decided they're gonna stop the transport of people aid workers into Yemen for two weeks because they don't want someone to come in who's infected and infect the population. And, and that makes sense. But they have not stopped aid from coming in. So I don't understand, Aisha, if it's the Houthis who are in charge of Sana'a, how can the Saudis control the airport? Because the only flights that are allowed by Saudi to fly in Sana'a can get into Sana'a. And so how do they control that? From Jordan, the flights can come from Jordan and the Saudis approve it before it can fly to Sana'a and approve what gets on it before it gets to Sana'a. So if you mid, mid, want to go to Yemen and we, uh, you know, you have to submit your name to the Saudi, any health, uh, any aid worker, they need to submit their names to the Saudis to approve them to get on that flight. Anything that gets on that flight that goes to Sana'a has to be approved by the by the Houthis, by, no. uh, by the Saudis. So they are in control of Sana'a airport. Let's and no, like for example in Gaza, the you know um, when when they found cases, Qatar decided they're going to you know support them and they gave them uh, fifteen million dollars. So if, if Qatar, for example, want to fly in to Sana'a airport and provide equipment you know, uh, reagents or they can't, they get need to get approval from the Saudis and the Saudis are not approving any flights except that specific UN flight that gets into Sana'a airport. So can you talk about the uh, critical port of Hudaydah? Uh, there's been a lot of uh, fighting around there and jockeying for control. Where does that stand now? So the port of Hudaydah is the port that is the largest in Yemen. And since Yemen imports 90% of its needs, whether it's medicine or essential goods or food, that is the main uh, port that is used to bring goods into Yemen. The other ports are, are smaller and cannot support the, the entire Yemeni population. So in the beginning of the war, under the Obama administration, they, everybody, all agencies and the warring uh, factions decided that the Hdeida port is going to be off limit. 
what they call in wars a red line. Nobody's going to try and attack it. So because that's the only place where goods can come through into Yemen. Even that, no ship can dock into, into that port without Saudi prior approval. And they can hold ships up to 83 days or more uh, before they're allowed to dock into Yemen, uh, into that port. So the, and unfortunately, in 2016, the Emiratis decided that they want to take control of the port, and they started an offense in 2016. There have been multiple war, you know, fightings in, in the area, but again, the international community came back again, and they decided to you know, halt the fighting in Hodeida. So there are, uh, the fighting has halted, but there are skirmishes from time to time. But again, uh, you know, it's like having your door, you control who gets into your home, but then you have, uh, you know, the outside your door, they decide who gets into, to knock at your door. That's what's happening in Yemen. The Saudis are the people who decide who gets into Yemen. And going back to the political situation for a minute, um, the Emirates, Emiratis were involved and had troops on the ground. Did they all leave? That's what we've been hearing, that the Emiratis have decided to leave and that they uh, took all the soldiers, the Emirati soldiers with them. But we also have to remember that the Emiratis have also used a lot of mercenaries, um, especially from South America and South Africa, to the point that the South American government were very upset because these were their elite forces that were trained by the U.S. government to fight uh, crimes, uh, in, and especially uh, drug crimes in South America. But the Emiratis were giving them a lot more money, and they were depleting these countries out of these fighters. In addition to that, the Emiratis also have trained loyalists to them. Um, and according to them, there are about 200,000 people who have been trained by the Emiratis. These are Yemeni that are uh, supported by the Emiratis. And apparently, I, I haven't seen numbers. Uh, they are paid also by, by the Emiratis. So they have, they have people that they've left behind to uh, make sure that their interest in Yemen and the Emiratis' interest in Yemen is ports. And isn't, uh, haven't they been supporting the separatists in the South? Uh, yes, and that's uh, part of the contingents of 200,000 people that they've trained. They are tra uh, also support. That's one of them. The separatists in the South is one of the groups that they are supporting. The Emiratis are interested in Aden, Aden uh, port. Aden port actually is uh, a natural port. Compare, you know, if you compare it to uh, the port in Dubai, that's actually more challenging to get into it for ships. But they have initially, under the Saleh government, rented uh, Aden port for 100 years. And they said they were going to you know, develop it and make it active. But in those times, they actually uh, made sure that it was never active. And then during the 2011 uh, Arab Spring in Yemen, uh, the youth insisted that that port and the agreement with the Emiratis be not nullified. And it was nullified. So they find another way to come and make sure that the Adam port is closed. Uh -huh. And uh, um, it has also been said that uh, the fighting uh, between the Houthis and the, the Saudis uh, has left uh, a vacuum in certain areas that uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS have taken advantage of and grown. Is that true? Well, actually, that is it, I, that's a very a positive statement. Yes, that is actually true. If you look at maps that are created, whether it's by crisis group or by international groups that track uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, you will see that they are not in the Houthi areas because they are you know, mortal enemies to the Houthis. Uh, and the Houthis fought them and defeated them in many places and got them out of many areas that they control. And you will find that the Saudi Emirati the internationally recognized government areas, that those are the areas where the I ISIS and Al-Qaeda are. And there were instances, and CNN reported that, and BBC also reported that, that in some areas they are fighting with the Emiratis as well. So here you have the uh, Saudis and their coalition partners fighting the Houthis who are aligned with Iran. You have the, uh, the separatists who are supporting uh, by the Emiratis 
you have Al Qaeda and ISIS. Um, how will there ever be peace in Yemen? And what is the status of the different peace talks that have happened? Yeah, I, you know, I can, uh, coming from Yemen and knowing that Yemen had survived for thousands of years, uh, I think, and also being a tribal culture, they know how to, uh, you know, make peace within themselves. I think the the culture is has learned from thousands of years of how you come together, how you negotiate peace, and how you you know work together despite many differences. I think if the Yemeni are left alone, they will be able to sit down and and work at peace uh, agreement. I think just having the Saudi, um, you know. And, 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 and many people, not me, including those who are with the internationally recognized government, would say that the internationally rec recognized government is hostage in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the president of Yemen, the internationally recognized government, cannot even travel to Yemen. When he tried, he, his plane wasn't allowed to land in Aden. That's, um, that's how much control he has over the areas that are under the Saudi Emirati control. So I think if the Saudis leave the Yemeni alone, um, I think the Yemenis will reach an agreement. The um, Ansar Allah or the Houthis have multiple times said that they are ready for peace. They have uh, for, you know, I think they six weeks or eight weeks decided that they're not gonna be, you know, targeting anyone, uh, hoping that there is a hand is gonna be, uh, you know, extended to them. Uh, so there will be peace. Yesterday, uh, Martin Griffith talked to the government of Sana'a again. From the UN, Martin Griffith. From the UN. Martin Griffith is the UN envoy to Yemen. Uh, and the Sana'a government is again extending its hand to uh, peace. But this time they're saying it has to come from the Saudis. They're not going to count on the Yemeni, uh, uh, the Saudis, because they, those don't have controls. And I tend to agree with that. So that should move us then to look at the U.S. role. Uh, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about what the U.S. Uh, and some other Western countries have been doing as far as supporting the Saudis and uh, what, uh, what uh, is the situation in Congress versus the White House. So as, as you said earlier, unfortunately, this war was announced, uh, it was supported by President Obama. It was announced, as I said, from Washington, D.C. Uh, so both governments, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, have supported the Saudis. Um, as far as the President Obama, the, at least the writings uh, so far has said that he wanted the Saudis to buy in into the Iran agreement, and that's why he supported the Saudis. And we all know where the Iran agreements in today. And even with that, I actually think it's um, horrible that he thinks he can sacrifice the people of Yemen so he can have an agreement uh, for Iran. That's just totally unacceptable. Uh, with President uh, Trump, he's actually more honest to be, uh, in, in my mind. He said it, what's important to him is selling arms. And as long as our Saudis are supporting the U.S. economy with uh, arms sales, he's okay with it. And we all remember him with the big boards uh, in his hands next to Mohammed bin Salman, you know, uh, gloating about, you know, how much the Saudis are spending in arms um, and how much money that is bringing to the U.S. government. Uh, but again, I mean, no matter how much the Saudis are buying, look at where we are today with the coronavirus. Uh, Government had to cough up, you know, two to three trillion dollars to to support the economy and support people. That just tells me we really did not need the money from the Saudis for this war. Uh, that that's nothing. That's peanuts compared to what we are able to uh, use our own money without, uh, you know, using blood money to support our economy. I think. Uh, I hope that um, the US president now understands this. Uh, in terms of Congress and the Senate, we've had much better uh, luck with uh, a Democratic uh, House of Representatives in passing um, laws that says the US should not support the war, uh, the Saudi war on Yemen. Unfortunately, uh, the Senate controlled by uh, Mitch McConnell has been not just against anything that's good for uh, international communities like Yemen, 
he's also been not good for the American public uh, as well. Uh, we did, however, have two bills that passed the Senate that supported ending U the U.S. support for the Saudi, but the White House, um, you know, as we all know, vetoed those. Uh, I think in the midst of a coronavirus outbreak that's pandemic, that's affecting everyone, um, the ICRC actually tweeted that said, hey, world, if you feel uh, alone, if you feel you cannot travel, your, you know, your airports are closed, your cities are closed. This is how Yemenis have felt for five years. I hope that the international community now come together. We have to fight this pandemic together. This is not something that one country can say, hey, I won and I'm gonna close my borders and this virus is not gonna come. We have to fight this virus everywhere for the world to feel safe. And that's the community we live in today. I hope that this care uh, is gonna make us look inside and reflect and realize that for humanity to survive, we really need to work together. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. And before we open it up to questions from our uh, viewers, maybe Ariel, since you've done so much of this work with Code Pink, uh, you could tell, you could add to what Aisha has said about the work in Congress and any other work you think that um, people ought to know about and can maybe support us on. Sure. So the main work taking place in Congress right now um, is to invoke the War Powers Resolution. And we have worked extensively on this in regard to the Saudi-led uh, war in Yemen and U.S. participation. Invoking the War Powers Resolution says that without congressional authorization, uh, the president does not have the right to take the US into war. And so if we successfully get this invoked, then US participation or a large part of the US participation in the war uh, in Yemen would cease. Now, we have gotten it through both chambers of Congress previously, but Trump has vetoed it. Interestingly, this has now been extended to Iran as well because of the U.S. incitement against Iran and having brought us to the brink of war. So Congress has also been working on invoking the war powers resolution to prevent war with Iran, which would also help bolster the efforts to end the war in Yemen. We have a number of things right now as well taking place outside of Congress. So the G20 summit is coming up. For anybody who isn't aware of what the G20 is, it's composed of 19 countries and the European Union who together represent two thirds of the world's population and 80% of the world's trade. The G20 meets every year to discuss economic issues and ways to increase cooperation. And the year that uh, what's been picked for 2020 for the location of the G20 is Saudi Arabia. So we at Code Pink have um, initially, we were working extensively on getting countries to boycott Saudi, the G20 in Saudi Arabia. Amnesty International, for example, has said that they will not attend because of Saudi's uh, human rights abuses, uh, including the war in Yemen. Now, with the, the corona pandemic coming into the picture, uh, this has changed things somewhat. Uh, Saudi Arabia is convening a conversation this week of 20 countries, a, a virtual meeting, uh, to talk about the coronavirus pandemic. And while it's important for world leaders to come together and talk about this massive cross-border crisis, you know, we've been talking about, about the importance of working together as countries. The most urgent thing that Saudi Arabia do right now to address the coronavirus crisis is to immediately end the war in Yemen. And so we have um, an action up and we are appealing to the U.S., uh, the Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the US, uh, which is Princess Rima 
uh, Bint Badar al Saud, uh, to end the war in Yemen for the sake of the coronavirus crisis. You know, as you've been saying, this is a, a catastrophe that is that is imminently on the borders, and either way, this catastrophe is going to go in. But at the very least, we want to try to mitigate any parts of it that we can. And I want to encourage people who are watching and have joined us to go to codepink.org slash COVID-19 Yemen. And I'm going to put that link in the chat box. And it's also on the Facebook uh, page below the video in the comments. And let's see if we can begin to take some questions as well. Um, early on, we had a question asking if you believe that the Saudi government is hoping for coronavirus to crash through Yemen horrifically and um, that being a way for them to win the war. You know, despite my anger uh, at what the Saudis are doing in Yemen, uh, I cannot think that any human being, no matter how mean uh, they are or, or evil, that they wish for that to happen. I, I cannot contemplate or think that anyone would wish for this to happen. Uh, I would just add there, um, well, uh, they are very evil. Look at Koji. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but um, I don't think it would be helpful to them because we know that this virus doesn't know borders. And if they're trying to control it in Saudi Arabia, it would not help to have it spreading in Yemen. Uh, and as you know, there's a lot of people uh, that try to go back and forth in that border. Um, but um, the other thing is to recognize that uh, Saudi Arabia is going through another crisis of its own making, and that is the oil price when it started this oil war with Russia. And so it is losing hundreds of billions of dollars in, uh, with the uh, crash in the price of oil and uh, is not able to uh, muster up the kind of resources that it needs. And uh, also um, with this uh, uh, responsibility that it now has as the host of the uh, G20, um, I think uh, there is a way that other countries can use this to put pressure on the Saudis uh, around peace talks. Maybe I'm just being too optimistic, uh, but I wonder, you know, asking you, Aisha, who has seen these peace talks come and go and, and fail and fail, do you think there is more of an opening now? You know, uh, when there was, when the U.S., uh, Congress was um, looking into the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, and there was some language in it about, you know, stopping US support for the Saudi war. The Saudis were actually very open at that point in time into negotiation with uh, the Houthis. They were negotiation both in uh, Oman uh, and Muscat and also even in Saudi Arabia. Uh, however, that, as, we, as you know and I know, didn't pass and they took the language of Yemen out. And since then, the Saudi have really not shown a very serious effort to go back to uh, the negotiating table. Uh, I do hope that I said that this scare, um, I actually suspect that there are more, a lot more cases in Saudi Arabia than Saudi Arabia is reporting. They are very good at hiding data. They never like to share uh, information, especially if it's something like this. So I, again, that people with cool heads, uh, people with, with hearts uh, realize that really we need to come together. Um, uh, there is a, a call from the UN to end all wars. This is not the time for it. So I hope that the US uh, takes the lead on this as well and in a to uh, the UK and all the five permanent members of the UN because they really have power uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the wars that are going on there uh, in, in everywhere to say, you know, we're not going to support you. This war has to, these, all these wars have to end. 
So I'm, I'm hopeful because I'm always uh, positive and I actually think the majority of people in the world are actually wonderful and have good hearts. I think unfortunately we have very few who have the power and they're the one who ruin it for everyone. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a number of people that are asking if they do want to donate, um, where you would recommend them donate to. I know you spoke about the challenges of getting the aid in regardless, but people do want to know how they can help financially. Okay. Uh, I'm putting in our organization. I hope people can consider donating to yemenfoundation.org. As I said, 100% um, of the donations that people give to us, they go directly to services in Yemen. Uh, since e even the people who work with us in Yemen are all volunteers, we do pay them for transportation. So if we're working in Sada, for example, and uh, we need to have to, we buy also locally, so we don't ship from one place to another. First of all, roads in Yemen are awful, uh, and a lot of the, bridges between cities have been destroyed by airstrikes, but also fuel is extremely expensive in Yemen. So we try to buy locally, um, and we also get local merchants. So in one area where we were distributing food, the farmer had lots of eggs, so we bought eggs from him and distributed to those who need. In other places, lentils was quite uh, abundant, and we bought, bought lentils. So whatever people, and it cost us $30, to uh, provide a basket of food for a family of six that sustains them for one month. Uh, what th that contains is 25 kilograms of, of flour, a wheat, uh, 10 kilograms of rice, uh, four liters of oil. Um, we also buy, as I said, lentils or whatever is available in the markets as a source of protein or eggs. And uh, we also buy uh, powdered milk. And um, during Ramadan, we also, which is coming next month, we buy dates uh, for the families. So, um, and, and this is, you know, we actually are very good at negotiating best prices because we also get um, companies that we buy from to donate to us as well because they know that we are doing this uh, at the minimum cost. So any donations uh, will be very grateful for that. And as I said, we reach areas that nobody else can reach. Well, we are nearing the top of the hour and um, at the end of this, we do have one more question. Uh, somebody would like to know if this war continues, if it remains prolonged, do you think it will result in more attacks such as the one that took place on the Saudi Aramco facility? Um, I, yes, I think so. The, the, if the Saudis are smart, uh, I think they will try to end the war. And the reason I say that is in the past, uh, when they attacked Yemen, it was all a surprise. Uh, nobody expected this to happen. Uh, the Houthis or the government in Sana'a, I don't like to say the Houthis because they, they're not the only one fighting the Saudis. It's actually a coalition of a lot of Yemenis. Um, and I would say probably about 80% of the Yemeni are the government of Sana'a today. Uh, so it's the government of Sana'a uh, in mean, meanwhile, during the five year of war, have developed uh, capabilities to respond to the Saudis. So one of the things they were always able to come in and bomb anytime they want uh, and not fear any fire to, to their planes. In the last month, uh, they, the Yemenis have developed a way to target their uh, flights. So multiple times they came in in formation to uh, bomb and uh, they, you know, I'm not a, a military expert, but basically they were fired on and they had to leave without bombing anything in Yemen. So the capabilities within Yemen have gotten much, much better. And uh, they definitely can target Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they have been targeting airports um, that, you know, close to the border in Yemen, I think quite uh, often. 
and a lot of the flights to these air airports have uh, not been uh, used, or you know, they've had to be to go somewhere else. So the capabilities within Yemen had improved quite a bit since uh, the war started. And I think when I was in Yemen this summer, um, I was there June and July. Uh, the mood in Yemen is much better than the year before because there is a sense of um, defiance. And I think the sense of defiance came in because people realize we've survived the worst and we, we don't have anything else to lose. And so um, the enemy has more to lose at this point in time. So I do hope that all these factors are considered by the Saudis uh, in terms of, for the Yemenis, they, they actually do think there is nothing else to lose. Uh, and yet the Saudis have a lot to lose at this point in time. So for, well, the, yeah. for everybody's sake, they need to stop. Yeah, at this moment in time, we all have so much to lose all over the world. And uh, I want to say how enriching this discussion has been. Uh, Aisha, you have a, a wealth of information as well as a beautiful heart. And uh, it's quite extraordinary to have somebody with your uh, background and expertise in epidemiology. I know you had a whole bunch of slides you wanted to show us um, that we'll save for another day. Uh, but to have uh, your knowledge and the work that you've been doing uh, in Yemen and then the uh, political will to get involved at the level of Washington politics, it's all quite unique. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us. And I was going to uh, close out by saying some of the words of the Secretary General, but uh, Ariel, did you want to say anything before we close? I would just like to again direct people to the latest action that we are asking people to take and that's at codepink.org slash COVID-19 Yemen. So the Secretary General is not known for making a lot of very um, eloquent uh, pronouncements, but what he did was quite extraordinary. And he said that the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. I think that's quite an extraordinary um, statement. He also said that we have to put armed conflict in lockdown and end the sickness of war and work together to fight this disease that is ravaging our world. So on that note, uh, once again, thank you, Aisha. Thank you for those who have been watching and let's work together to put armed conflict on lockdown and stop the sickness of war. Thank, thank you, you everyone. For for thank thank you. you everyone for joining us.